Greetings. This is the commentary and sermonette on the song, Now That Seems Fair to Me. This was song number 48, and in the lyrics that I typed up, I said copyright 1981. So that was when I would have been at this street gospel mission in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Now, I also wrote in my notes at the top, there's a song I've done called The Mighty One. It's a song about the judgment. I was getting a little gun shy. I asked God to help me. Then I realized how great an expectation that day is, judgment day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Man is having his day now. Look what he's doing with it. But God is patiently waiting and all creation is heading into his day. Why such a great expectation? Well, man isn't going to get away with all he's done and all he's doing. He thinks he's going to get away with it, but he's deceiving himself because God makes it clear he's got our number. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Man does not consider in his heart that God remembers all of his wickedness. Now his deeds are all around him. They are before the Lord's face. Most people don't believe any of this. That's obvious, but that doesn't make any difference. Now, when I start to work these songs up, I will go to my notes and find places where I did different versions of it. Sometimes I'll have a middle part that I've uh, come up with, and so I'll just have that somewhere, or an ending, or an introduction. And so I listen to all the varied places where I have listed on my page here where to find the song. On this little cassette tape, this is what I found on what would be my original version. Quote, I think the Lord is re-inspiring me by giving me tunes. Boy, it's been a long dry spell. I just picked it up, and that last tune and this one all came today. And I only sat down for a few minutes. Hallelujah, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. I just wanted to thank you and bless your holy name. Please take this over, I think is what I said. Amen. And then I started playing. And it was pretty incomplete, but the main thrust of it was there. And so I think it was in response to this quote that I read that's on the front of my uh, song sheet of how I was a little bit gun shy about the judgment because you're proclaiming something that who wants to hear it? So let's go right on into the lyrics. One of the most glorious teachings of the Bible is what's called the judgment. It's going to be a glorious event. For the execution of justice is joy for the righteous, but terror to the workers of iniquity. Now you can see how this just plays right into the great and terrible day of the Lord. Great and terrible. Well, it depends which side of the fence you're on. And then I go into, first of all, it's not dependent upon man, but rather upon God. For it's been made for man, the creature to his creator answering. For every deed ever done, every word ever spoken, and every single thought ever had. Friend, I'm just telling you what God has said. Now let's take a look. Those are bold statements. The creature to the creator answering. There is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We are his creatures. So the judgment is a day that's been made by God for his creatures that he has deemed are morally accountable. Well, the angels are also going to be there because we're told that as a Christian, we will be with Jesus judging the world. And Paul said, don't you know we're going to judge angels? So it appears to me the Judgment Day, that's going to be their day also. It's all going to be wrapped up right then. Now, as far as answering for every deed ever done, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. He says we all have a certificate of death that's hostile against us. And for Christians, another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
that certificate of debt was put on Jesus on the cross, and so our names are transferred into the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. It's the very next verse. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. So it would be for things God has determined that a person is responsible for and accountable for. They knew what they were doing. Those are the deeds. When Jesus was confronting the Pharisees, he said, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man, out of his good treasure, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of his evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So we're going to be answering for every deed ever done, every word ever spoken, and every thought ever had. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and is able to judge to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And to even add to this further, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So every deed is going to be accounted for. Every word there will be a reckoning for. Every single thought ever had. The intentions of the heart and the secrets of the heart. Friend, I'm just telling you what God has said. For all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This claim, or these claims, are absolutely astounding. We currently have seven or eight billion people on this planet. To think God keeps track of every single detail, including the secrets of each individual's heart, and all the people that have lived in the past, nothing forgotten, and however much longer this age is going to continue, where every single detail is fully preserved by God himself, with each one having their own individual book or rap sheet. And it's not just man, but also the angels, and however long they've been around, and however fast they are and what all they can do, everything is kept completely intact. Now, you know what I'm going to say here. I can hardly remember what I ate yesterday. I have to think about it. I have thoughts go in and out of my head all the time, and I don't even remember them. I was driving to work about six months ago. And all I was doing was driving to work. And I got to work, and it's like, Robin, what did you think about for the last 15 minutes driving in here? And I started reflecting on some of it, and it's like, all I could do is hang my head and say, God Almighty, be merciful to me, the sinner. He's kept track of all that. I think he was just bringing to mind part of what I thought about on the way in to show me how vain my thinking is and how corrupted it is. And yet he's keeping track of all of it, every single thing, every detail. This is power, this is greatness, this is reality that is so far beyond our comprehension of who we're dealing with. I had a guy just recently tell me how he was doing something. He says, well, I take full responsibility for it and I'm comfortable with it. And it was something that was anti-God. And I just said, look, I'm just telling you, you might think you're going to take responsibility for it. You have no idea. We have no idea who we're dealing with. So first, not dependent upon man. We've got no vote on this. Our opinion about this is irrelevant. God has determined this fixed day. So I say, secondly, it's already appointed. A set day or a fixed day at the end of time. And there's one anointed as judge. His justice does shine. For he was judged and condemned unrighteously by men. So he's earned the right to judge them beyond death's door, only righteously. Now that seems, that seems fair to me. 
One of the early points in my conversion was this very truth. I'm reading about Jesus, and he was clearly framed, and he was condemned by men. And then I read something like this. Paul was in Athens, and they were always wanting to learn and hear new things. So they wanted Paul to talk to him in the, the Council of Areopagus or something, but it's a pretty formal kind of thing where he had his chance to speak and you know give his case of what he was talking about. And he says, I'm passing through and examining the objects of your worship, and I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So they would worship this unknown God. And he says, let me tell you about this unknown God. So Paul gets into things about God. He's not served by human hands, and he doesn't live in a temple. And he says that we are uh, offspring of God. He even quotes a couple of their philosophers, religious philosophers, and confirms some things that they were saying. But he says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, so the unknown God, ignorant of it, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. It's a change of mind because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom was the Elephilus, the Agriphiite, or whatever, a woman named Demetrius, and others with them. Now, a lot of people have said that well, this was like a failed mission that Paul had. Look, if one person winds up eternally saved, we have no way to even begin to appreciate or understand how that's going to affect eternity and what goes on in the kingdom of the beloved Son, this eternal kingdom. One converted soul being there producing or whatever is going to happen forever paul did not have a failed mission in athens the more i look at this and i want to even look this whole thing over more carefully he talked to them in terms they could understand and that message penetrated he didn't compromise anything but he did meet them in their own frame of reference in such a way that's just masterful so a lot of people have said it was like a failed thing because not too many people got converted. Look, he lists several right here. One man and a woman and others with them. Phenomenal. But he's saying it's a fixed day at the end of time and there's one anointed as judge, it's Jesus. And when I read this and I thought, the Bible's saying that God became a man that's who Jesus was, and he came among his own things. And those who were his own, who should have recognized him and received him, they didn't just reject him, they had him framed. And they got him before the Romans to get him murdered. He was judged and condemned unrighteously by men. And for him to now be the judge of man on the other side of death's door, I remember saying, you know, that seems right to me. I liked that. And that, of course, is the thrust of this song. Okay, so then I go into this part. So no matter what path you're going down, he's already at its end waiting for you to come around that last bend, and there you'll meet him. Will you be standing in him or your sin? We're either in Christ, and he's going to make us stand, or we're going to be in our sin. And as the Revelation said, the great white throne trying to flee, the rocks fall on us, and there's nowhere to go. Oh, there is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. You might think you have strong arguments, strong objections, a strong case, and that you're going to prevail isn't going to happen. He says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that he is indeed the Lord. I don't think it's going to be where he's 
looking down where it would be fire in his eyes and there's just absolute fear and people fall before him. I think that book's gonna be opened. I think each individual is gonna be completely overwhelmed by their error, by their sin, by their wrongness, will at the same time know of his rightness, and it's gonna be so overwhelming that people will collapse, even those who do not keep their soul alive. It'll be too late. There is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord, and I said, well, none that will prevail anyway. You see, he's been through this life too and takes no excuses. And in my video, you'll see there's the woman caught in adultery. That's a phenomenal account there. And he did not excuse what she did, but they were violating the law of Moses themselves because it should have been two people brought forward to be executed. I think that's what he wrote on the ground. And whenever the older ones saw that, then they scurried away and they violated the younger ones as well. Then there weren't two witnesses there to accuse her. And Jesus said, no one here to accuse you? Well, neither do I condemn you, because Jesus would just be one. Go and sin no more. But he takes no excuses. He's been through this life. I've went through a tremendous injustice, without getting into all the details, by the Commonwealth of Kentucky, or the laws of this Commonwealth concerning divorce. As I was under the assault, Lord, do you understand what injustice feels like? He sure does. Did you sin when you were under injustice? No. Did you become embittered? No. You didn't compromise and you committed yourself to the Father and you are gonna have your day and God can do the same thing in us and with us and we'll have our turn. That's what the Judgment Day is about. Now, the only way you can live through it, the Judgment, is if between now and that day, you get the blood of the Lamb for your payment and the righteousness that's heaven sent. For these pave the way from wrath to peace with God. He's got what we need. Seek and receive. How will you escape your rap sheet if you ignore such a great deliverance. Deliverance and salvation is the exact same word. There's a few times in the book of Acts that it's just translated deliverance. Salvation, it means deliverance. How will you escape if you ignore or neglect such a great deliverance? Deliverance from what? Deliverance from our sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. So what do we got to get between now and that day? The blood of the Lamb for your payment. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon earth, knowing that you were not redeemed or ransomed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That is what pays for our sins. That's why I would say Jesus died for me. God says the life of the flesh is in the blood. He requires our life because of our sin. And when Jesus died on the cross, his blood is what has the power to pay for our sins because he had no sin of his own and the righteousness that is heaven sent. These are the garments of salvation. It's like you're clothed with, first of all, the blood where he then passes over us because the sins he sees are paid for. It's like the Passover lamb. That's what happened on the last plague in Egypt is people would put blood over their door and on the doorpost, and when the angel of death saw that, he would pass over them. Jesus is the Passover lamb and the blood applied to us, the angel of death or the wrath of God will pass over us. But we're also given the righteousness of Christ. He says, for if by the transgression of the one, he's talking about Adam and his sin, 
death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He's the second Adam. It's another way it's phrased. You had the first Adam. He was created in innocence. He fell. He rebelled. He sinned. And death entered the world and it spread to all men. And we're all in Adam in our natural state, and we're all part of that group. Now, when we receive the abundance of grace, God's gift to us in terms of pardon, we're also given the gift of righteousness, and we're going to reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. That's why we're standing in him or our sin. So the gift of righteousness is... It's very simple, really, is that whenever God raised up Moses and gave the law through him in the nation of Israel, then he gave specific information of what he considered right and wrong. The Jews didn't live up to it, and Paul later says all it does is condemn all of us, Jews and Gentiles, because none of us live up to it. He called it the ministry of death. Well, the point of Jesus coming into this age is through Moses he preached what he expected of man, no one fulfilled it. And God said he prepared for his own self a body and he entered into this creation. He was born under the law and he came here and practiced what he had preached. That's who Jesus is, that's what he did. One place in Isaiah talks about a tender shoot springing up out of parched ground. Everything is just dead. And there's one tender shoot that sprung up that is alive, and that would be Jesus, born under the law. He obeyed the law perfectly, and when he was on the cross, because he had no sin, God the Father took advantage of that moment and placed my sins, your sins, our sins upon Jesus, and he was turned into sin, and he was cursed on our behalf. And the wrath of the Father was pleased to crush him, and the moment Jesus died, on the other side of death's door, there he was. The sins had been paid for that were on him. He's on the other side of death's door. He still has no sin. Death had no authority, had no jurisdiction there. No rightful claim to him. It was mandatory that he rose from the dead. We are given his obedience to the law. It's part of our inheritance. He says we are adopted as sons and daughters. We're not adopted sons and daughters. We're adopted as sons, as daughters. Like if you got adopted by someone in this life, as an infant, you have no idea what is coming your way from that family. It's the same thing with a Christian. We're born again, a son or daughter now, in this kingdom of Jesus Christ. God is our Father, and he says that if he didn't hesitate to give us his son to die for us, why would he withhold anything from us? So part of the inheritance we're given, the blood of Christ is applied and we're given the righteousness of Christ. And that's why God sees us in perfection, not only forgiven, but righteous. We have the righteousness of Christ. So between now and that day, you got to get the blood of the lamb for your payment and the righteousness that's heaven sent. These pave the way. Those are the two rails that move us from wrath with God into peace with God. He has no case against us now. Sins have been paid for. There's no second extraction for any sin we've committed. He's got what we need. Seek and receive. You will search for me and you'll find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. But how will you escape if you ignore such a great deliverance? You won't. Your rap sheet is going to damn you. It's going to condemn you. There is no way any of us come out clean. Then I close. This is just a teeny tiny glimpse of one of the most glorious teachings of the Bible. A day that's called the judgment. Oh, it's going to be a glorious event. And then I think I say, man's day will be wrapped up. Man's day comes to an end. And it will be the Lord's day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. You know, when it says it's going to be a glorious event, glorious, I think mainly of shiny and just light. And 
that's all partly true, but it's also the word for honor. It, it means to have weight. It's going to be an honorable day. When I say a teeny tiny glimpse of what this day is going to be, I'll just say this and I'm going to close. I believe that this entire episode of fallen angels and then the fall of man and the redemptive plan to save sinners and yet that's not available for the angels that fell. I think all of this whole thing is designed and headed for the primary purpose of the great and terrible day of the Lord, where it's going to be exposed for all eternity. And I don't think anything like this is ever going to happen again. When you have morally accountable creatures, when they rebel against God, or when they are fallen or born in sin and have a sin nature, what happens, what they do, what these creatures do that are cut off through their own fault or maybe not any fault of their own from God Almighty himself. One place talks about the chosen angels. I can tell you the angels that did not follow Satan they aren't beating their chest about how good and great they are. They know God kept them. And for those of us who are sinners that wind up in Christ, we're going to have no case to boast about how we figured all this out and how great we were and enlightened we are and how smart we are. That isn't how this is going to work. God is extending mercy, whether he kept them from sin or pulls us out of sin, and it's not owed and I think this is going to be an eternal demonstration of what two orders of morally accountable creatures turned into when they're separated from the source of life, the source of morality from God himself. And then dealing with us is how he could concoct a plan to where he doesn't compromise himself and yet can bring us out of this terrible predicament that we're in. And everything's heading to the judgment. Everything's heading to judgment day. It's that day, the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is the day that everything has been designed and headed for to demonstrate things about God that is going to resound, I believe, through all eternity in whatever other created orders he may or may not choose to make. It's going to be seen everywhere. Everyone's going to know. And it'll be clear that apart from him, there's nothing but mayhem, suffering, death, trauma, injury, chaos, darkness. It's going to be as clear as can possibly be seen. I think he decided he wanted to have this made known. God Almighty, anybody that's listening to this, Lord, I pray you might give them the power to say yes and come to you. You're the one that extends mercy, and that's what I'm asking for. Well, I want to close with that. I want to thank you for listening. And you know what I always say when I get done with these. Listen, you're going to learn great and mighty things that you do not know. And when you listen to this material... It always and only leads to life. That's who God is. And as you embrace it, there's one outcome. You will indeed live. Mm -hmm.